Uh, hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. And I say that every week, but wow, this week is really true. I, you know, Juan Cole, I don't, I'm, I'm accused of giving too long introductions, so I'm not going to do that. But this is the leading, I was going to say academic expert on the Middle East, uh, but the leading expert, period, end of sentence, at least in the United States. They probably got some sharper people in Spain and Italy. But I've known this guy for a long time. He came out of UCLA, he studied under the great Nikki Keddy, who knew a lot about Iran when people didn't want to know about Iran. Uh, he's Arabic uh, fluent and all that. Uh, and what I really loved all these years, no matter what was happening, you were always calm and judicious. And, and you really uh, unravel complex things. My favorite book of yours is on Muhammad, on the prophet of Muhammad and connecting uh, what is known of his life as a traitor to his own views and openness. And it's a great demystifying book. And now, but however, as a measure of how horrible things are in this region that you have covered, I read your article today and it was a different Juan Cole. Uh, you know, it's, it's distributed by Tom Dispatch. It's on your own informed comments site. We have it on Share Post. I hope everybody carries it. And but you refer to Netanyahu as a fascist, and that was so. Um, I don't know. It, it caught me. Uh, so explain it. Explain what you think is really going on there now. Well, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the current Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, has throughout his political career, you know, acted uh, as a pragmatist to some extent, and he's made alliances with the center, even the left. Uh, but his political tradition, the intellectual background of his thinking uh, in the Likud party, which is the ruling party in Israel now, um, uh, really does have a fascist philosophical grounding. And it goes back to uh, Zev uh, Yabotinsky, originally Vladimir Yabotinsky, who was writing in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, and who put forth uh, the theory that, you know, the European Jews in, in Palestine, in British Mandate Palestine, were colonizers, uh, and that the Arab population uh, would never accept they're colonizing Palestinian land, and that the only thing that one could do uh, is to form an iron wall of militiamen, essentially, uh, and um, beat up the Arabs. And uh, if they give you any guff, uh, crush them. And eventually, when they saw that they couldn't defeat uh, the, the Zionist militias, uh, they, they would maybe then grudgingly uh, allowed the, the, uh, the Jews to have at least some part of Palestine. That was uh, Jabotinsky's theory. And uh, it became the bedrock of the Likud party, of the, of the Beitar uh, Youth League. And uh, it, you know, it, it gave rise, because of the nature of the theory, to some terrorism groups, um, terrorist groups, uh, uh, Irgun being the famous one, which blew up the King David Hotel uh, in 1946 in Jerusalem, killing, uh, I think, 96 people, including a lot of civilians, although it was targeted at British intelligence. And they, it was this group that shot up the village of Deir Yassin in 1948, with which other Jewish groups, the Haganah, had made a kind of peace treaty. But the Irgun came in and, and just machine gunned these villagers down to encourage the Palestinians to flee and ethnically cleanse, uh, ethnically cleanse Palestine so that the uh, Zionists could take it. And, and so that's the background of the Likud party. And in, 19, in 2006, on the anniversary of the bombing of the King David Hotel, they held a, a celebration in Jerusalem uh, commemorating uh, this deed, uh, at, at which the British government was furious, and they issued a 
communicate condemning Netanyahu and the Likud for for celebrating this act of terrorism. So, the, but you know, it's it's actually not controversial uh, to say that. Netanyahu comes out of a fascist tradition. Well, having said that, but in the current context, there is an irony. Wasn't it Netanyahu thought that he could use Hamas and use it as a divide and conquer wedge against the PLO and the PLO was vulnerable because it was more secular and had a more advanced or more open position uh, to coexisting with Israel and uh, the irony here is that this Hamas group, which is now considered, you know, the most evil terrorist force in the eyes of the United States, I guess, uh, because we get along with uh, Saudi Arabia, we get along with a lot of different players, and we don't get along with Iran, which you're quite an expert on. But nonetheless, Netanyahu really uh, thought he could work with Hamas, right? And live with them, and that's backfired terribly. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the Israeli backing for uh, Hamas, which came out of the Palestinian branch of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which established itself in Gaza in the mid-1930s, uh, it didn't really turn into uh, a party militia of the Hamas sort until the late 1980s. And when the Israeli intelligence saw this happening, uh, it wasn't just Netanyahu. It was, it was previous governments as well uh, that saw an opportunity to split the Palestinians because the Palestinians had been united under the umbrella of the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is a multitude of, of, of parties and factions, many of them on the far left uh, and uh, uh, with uh, Fatah, uh, which had been led by Yasser Arafat and is now led by Mahmoud Abbas, uh, being a kind of um, middle-class centrist party. And um, however, all of these parties in, inside the PLO umbrella were secular parties. And Hamas was a Muslim fundamentalist movement. So Richard Sales, who you, perhaps you knew him at, at Associated Press, uh, started reporting in the late 1980s on the Israeli intelligence giving Hamas support uh, in Gaza as, as a way of, of splitting the Palestinians. And uh, Netanyahu just continued this old policy. But by the time he was uh, uh, prime minister um, in 2006, uh, the Bush administration had uh, forced the Israelis to allow elections in the Palestinian territories. Uh, and the PLO, as usual, did well in the West Bank, but Hamas uh, won in Gaza, and then it won in some constituencies in the West Bank, and it, it overall won. So Hamas became the government of the Palestine Authority, which had been established uh, in, in 1993 by the Oslo Accords. And this outcome was unforeseen by Bush, uh, who, uh, who had, had twisted Ariel Sharon's arm to allow it allow these elections, and was unacceptable to the Israeli government, and I think ultimately to, even to the Bush administration. So it was a piece of political stupidity. You know, you don't, you don't hold elections and invite people to run if, if, if you don't approve of them winning, because they might win. So the, the U.S. And, and the Israelis made a coup against the Hamas government. The Israelis just went in and arrested a lot of the Hamas parliamentarians. Uh, and... Um, they were able to overthrow Hamas in the West Bank and it installed the PLO, uh, but they failed to overthrow the Hamas in Gaza. And so in 2007, as a result of this failure, the Israelis uh, clapped uh, very severe economic sanctions on Gaza. They had already destroyed its airport. Uh, they destroyed its harbor. It, it had no means of uh, egress from sea or, or air or land. They surrounded it. They put in checkpoints and they just wouldn't let a lot of things in. Uh, and uh, they destroyed its economy, you know, came to be 55 percent of people unemployed, uh, youth unemployment, 70 percent. But but Netanyahu thought that although this was a horrible situation, that the Gaza problem and the Hamas problem were 
were contained and that Hamas would be happy running its little fiefdom in, uh, in Gaza. Uh, and, and Netanyahu could concentrate on stealing the rest of the Palestinian West Bank. Uh, and he brought into his government when he came back to power uh, late last year, um, the most extreme, I mean, this is beyond fascism, the most extreme parties in Israel, uh, the religious Zionists and the Jewish power. Uh, I mean, the, these people are terrorists and uh, they, some of them actually have been on the, the State Department terrorism watch list, not allowed in the United States in the past. Uh, and he brought them into the cabinet. He made one of these guys, the, the uh, Minister of National Security, uh, put the other in the finance ministry and, and, and then gave him responsibilities as a civilian for overseeing uh, the Palestinian West Bank. And both of these uh, ministers uh, who were extremists were also uh, squatters on Palestinian land in the West Bank and, and wanted to uh, steal the rest of it to, to bring in more settlers. Uh, and one of the reasons that Hamas gave for the horrible atrocities that it uh, inexcusably committed on October 7th was, uh, was this um, push for literally for annexation by Israel of, of the Palestinian West Bank. And, and uh, they also instanced repeated Israeli attacks on the congregants at the, uh, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex uh, in Jerusalem, which is the third holiest site for uh, the, the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. So wh where are we in this? Because the, look, there was a large segment of the Israeli public that was in opposition to Netanyahu. They were demonstrating and so forth. They managed to ignore this open air prison of Gaza and they had managed to not advance very far in the whole West Bank situation. But nonetheless, there was widespread recognition that Netanyahu was hardly a democratic leader. He was destroying what, what existed of democracy in Israel. He was allied with elements that wanted to set back Israel. And now the narrative got changed. Okay, Hamas does this extreme uh, a hard act. And somehow history begins with that as if nothing had taken place. And the reason I want to bring that up, I happened to go to Gaza and the West Bank at the tail end of the Six-Day War. And then the Labor Party was in power. And I interviewed people like Alone and Diane and so forth. And they all talked a good game. They all said, you come back here in 10 years, or I think sometimes they said five years. And if we're still occupying these territories, which after all, Palestine hadn't waged a war against Israel. It's another fiction. Most people I talk to, you know, I just came from a college campus. Most people there think that somehow Palestine and Israel went to war, and that's how Israel got the West Bank and Gaza. And, and you know, the fact is Egypt controlled Gaza and, and Jordan controlled the West Bank and Syria controlled the Golanites. Palestinians were left out. They were, you know, they didn't get any national uh, uh, identity. And, and at that time, the Israelis I talked to, again, uh, many of them had come out of the kibbutzim movement and pre pretended at least to be progressives, uh, said we can't be an occupying power, an attractive Israeli democratic state. They seem to recognize that. Now, we, you know, there's been a lot done on this subject after you're a, a leading expert, but where are we now? And, and, you know, where, I mean, my goodness, the president of the United States, he claims he's for a two-state solution, but there would be no state left anyway uh, with what's going on. And uh, what does this mean for Israel? Well, Israel's stuck. Um, those people who told you in 1967 that uh, Israel was going to give the West Bank and Gaza back to the Palestinians were lying to you. Uh, or... Uh, were hopelessly naive. Uh, if Diane told you that, then he was just lying. Uh, but uh, they, the, the Israeli right wing, intended to keep those territories and to colonize them, and they almost immediately began putting Israeli colonies into these occupied territories, which is a war crime. It's it's illegal according to the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 for an occupying power to bring its own citizens into an occupied territory and settle it. It's what the 
the Nazis did to Poland, right? The, the, the Germans destroyed Warsaw and invaded Poland and took it over. And then they started expelling Poles or killing them and bringing in Germans to replace them. So that's a war crime. It's not allowed. Uh, and I think, you know, you would want to try to avoid looking like you were following a Nazi sort of policy. Uh, but that was essentially uh, the sort of thing that the Israelis did in, in the Palestinian territories. And uh, over time, they became very attached to them. And the more settlers and, and squatters that they sent in there, because often these uh, squatters were backed by the government, they were given money to go and, and, and settle over there. And, and the, the government would formally exercise eminent domain and take over private Palestinian land to put uh, Israelis on, which again is illegal in international law, but they did it. Uh, well, now, if you count the area of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, that was part of the West Bank, which Israel has illegally annexed, along with what's left of the West Bank, um, you have seven, 800,000 Israeli uh, settlers uh, on Palestinian land there. How are you going to have a Palestinian state under those conditions? Uh, it, it's, it, if you look at the distribution of the populations, the, the West Bank is like Swiss cheese. There's no possibility of a two-state solution. There hasn't been for, I would say, at least 20 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mitt Romney, uh, if the poor guy gave a, a campaign speech when he was running for president in 2012 uh, to a bunch of uh, uh, rich donors, and I think it was in Florida, and he got he got uh, uh, video doing it. He wasn't expecting these remarks to become public, but he said, "You can't give the Palestinians a state. It's politically unviable." Uh, he didn't say why, but obviously the the uh, the Israelis would never accept it, and, and the American Jewish community would be upset. Uh, and uh, and the evangelicals would be upset. So he said, uh, the only thing you can do with that issue is just kick it on down the road. Um, so that's been the policy of the United States, is to kick the can down the road and to hope nothing bad happens. And Biden was very much part of that policy and still is. And unfortunately for him, uh, the, the thing they thought there was a can that they were kicking down the road was, was a live grenade. Well, let's let's take that because the alternative would be is one person, one vote uh, or ethnic cleansing where you drive people out of the whole territory uh, to live in inhospitable Arab countries or on the desert or just kill them. Uh, the vicious ethnic cleansing uh, or you say we want to keep all this territory, but we'll have one state. And whoever lives here will be able to vote. And that's a, an idea that's gained some popularity, uh, you know, but uh, what is the alternative? What do you think is going to happen? I'm talking to a guy. I have to explain, uh, you know, my admiration for your wisdom. <laughs> it's embarrassing, really. I, I just can't think of anyone who knows more about this region in the United States, has written more effect, persuasively and with such knowledge. I mean, uh, I'm always gushing here because I've read your work and I've followed it. And I know there's no bullshit to your analysis. You've disagreed with me on a number of issues when you thought I got it wrong and so forth. What do you, and I'm asking him what I, I, a person I really respect, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I think you're right that there are a very limited number of scenarios now. Uh, one, as you say, would be a one-state solution where the Palestinians were given citizenship and Israel became a, a binational state, uh, sort of like Lebanon uh, or Bosnia. And uh, uh, another possibility would be uh, that the Palestinians would be ethnically cleansed, which the Israeli far right, and I say far right, but actually they're they're now in the center. Then they're 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 in control of the government. Uh, the Israeli far right favors the ethnic cleansing scenario, uh, but another possibility is that you just go on with apartheid, uh, where the Israeli government is de facto in control of everything between uh, the uh, Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea, uh, but the 
the Jews have full rights in that state, whereas the Palestinians are either second-class citizens or they're stateless and have no citizenship. Uh, and that's been the case now for a very long time. And I think uh, the likelihood is that it will just go on having apartheid, but an apartheid that allows the far right in Israel to chip away at uh, Palestinian uh, rights and, and, uh, and property uh, and gradually uh, steal the whole thing. So the, the, the ethnic cleansing scenario, you know, can, can work out uh, quickly or, or in the very long term. And I think, uh, I think some people in Israel think, think that it's more um, palatable to world opinion if they can gradually do what they, they call make, uh, making facts on the ground. Uh, and gradually move the Palestinians out. But that, that's their ultimate goal. But hasn't the reality made the Israeli politics more uh, transparent and, and as a result uh, more unattractive, including to American Jews? Now, I know every time I say this, people think I'm being naive, uh, but, uh, you know, I... I am an American Jew. I know a lot of Jewish people. And it seems to me uh, that the, uh, the American Jewish community would have a hard time giving this unqualified support to Israel. And as I say these words, I can already know I'm sounding naive. But I think it's in such fundamental contradiction with what most of the Jewish people that I certainly encounter think is the essence of Judaism, which is not apartheid and not viciousness towards other people and not killing children. I mean, you can't do ethnic cleansing without forcing people out into a, a biblical uh, exodus. Uh, you know, it, it's it's so visible now. And yes, you know, there, there's this horrible attack. But does that then justify, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, what dare we use the word genocide? I mean, what is I, I just wonder whether the plates haven't shifted and mm. it can't be just kicked down the road and it can't just be accepting. And and that and also the rest of the world doesn't seem to be hopping too. There's this, of course, enormous irony where I just can't swallow the words when I say it because my own father was a German Protestant. I've been to Germany many times. But the hypocrisy of Germany, of course, which was the author of the worst crime of, of, of modern history, the Holocaust, and the French, who certainly were anti-Semitic to a, a considerable degree, and others in Western Europe, now saying you can't even demonstrate for Palestinian rights. I mean, God, what, how do we get to this thing? The only reason that any portion of the Jewish community thought you could go back to Israel was because they were, thought they were unsafe in Germany or France or anywhere else where they might have ended up if they let them in. You know, so I, I, you know, as a as a student of this whole history, did you get any sense at all that maybe it's now this this posturing is untenable, that maybe the rest of the world won't go along, and certainly some of these deals that they thought Israel would get along with Saudi Arabia and with the Emirates and so forth, maybe that's not going to happen. You're the expert. Well. Uh... Uh, Bob, I, I, I confess that the, the more white hair I have, the more cynical I get. Um, I was uh, talking on a webinar uh, or, or at the Ford School uh, maybe 10 years ago on a panel with uh, the, the political scientist John Mearsheimer about these very issues. And at one point I said, well, you know, a fourth possibility, uh, we've mentioned three, uh, fourth possibility is that the Israelis themselves just decide that they don't want to be that guy, uh, that they don't they don't want to be, you know, the, the equivalent of the Afrikaners in South Africa under apartheid. Um, and um, I watch that occasionally and I slap myself uh, because it was such a stupid thing to say. Uh, then ever since I said it, the Israeli public has gone further and further to the right, and the governments have gone further and further to the right, and people have become more and more uh, sort of comfortable with uh, an extreme ethno-nationalism that dehumanizes the Palestinians to the point where now, 
you have these uh, professors in Israel talking about uh, there being no civilians in, in Gaza, that uh, everybody is Hamas and they all deserve to be killed after October 7th. Uh, and the American Jewish community is divided. Uh, the young people in particular don't like to be associated with this, uh, this kind of thing. And the, uh, the, you have Jewish Voices for Peace and, and Bernie Sanders, and you have a lot of decent people in the Jewish uh, American community who are very unhappy with the situation, but they're not powerful people. Uh, the most powerful people are the richest and uh, the uh, ones who vote for the Republican Party uh, or who give uh, money through lobbies like the American Israel uh, Public Affairs Committee, APAC, uh, who are uh, on the far right uh, and uh, who APAC even gave money to some of the insurrectionists. Uh, they're on the, they, they've tried to torpedo the Democratic Socialists of America movement inside the Democratic Party. Uh, so if you want to look where power lies, it lies with the people that are most comfortable with seeing the Palestinians simply ethnically cleansed. But this cannot be done without the uh, unqualified support of the United States. This has been the long story here. Uh, Israel succeeds in, on this trajectory only by having the most powerful empire in the history of the world give it a blank check. Yeah. And, and the irony here is with this massive military presence that Israel now has, and no one's even mentioning the question of nuclear weapons and Israel's possible use of a nuclear weapon if it really ever feels threatened by any uh, regional power or anyone. Uh, uh, and that was allowed to happen, even though we complained about everybody else. I want to segue to the area that even that you know more about even or the country that you know about than this, you, uh, and that's Iran. And you've been following Iran forever. And now the claim is Iran is really behind Hamas. And the strategy of, of the Biden administration seems to be, let's focus on Iran. Let's not have any more talk of progress. Let's blame them for all this. Uh, is that how you see what's happening? Well, I don't think that the relationship uh, is as tight as the Washington establishment does. Um, you know, actually, Hamas and Iran have gone back and forth. It should be remembered that Hamas is a hyper Sunni uh, fundamentalist organization. Often those people do not like uh, Shiites, which is the majority uh, of Iranians. Uh, and um, during the brief period uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt in 2012-2013, uh, Hamas dropped Iran like a hot potato and took up with uh, with uh, the Brotherhood in Egypt as its primary patron, uh, which you know the Iranians don't forget. Uh, and gradually, relationships have been repaired to some extent, uh, but um, I don't think the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps calls up Ismail Haniya and tells him do this tomorrow. I don't think there's a command and control uh, aspect to this relationship. And I, my, my best estimate is, of course, I don't have uh, any access to, to uh, classified intelligence, but my best estimate is that the October 7th attacks were planned by a small coterie of Hamas uh, higher ups. They did not consult anybody in Gaza, and I don't believe they consulted Iran. And the reason they didn't consult Iran in part is because they believe that Israel's intelligence agencies have deeply penetrated the Iranian government. And so if you told the Iranians something, it would go straight to, to the Israelis. Uh, and so I don't think, you know, those, there are those who have alleged that, that Hamas, Hamas was put up to this uh, attack by the Iranians. I don't, don't believe that's true. Um, but Iran uh, is part of the resistance front. Uh, it uh, is not comfortable with the role that Israel plays in the, in the region uh, and, and, and with it being backed by the United States to play that role, uh, sees it as, uh, as a form of colonialism uh, and uh, would like to push it out. Uh, or um, I think a one-state solution actually uh, uh, might be acceptable to the Iranians. At least that's the way they talk. But 
Uh, I don't know in the end what would happen if that if, if that unlikely outcome were implemented. But in any case, in the absence of that development, um, the Iranians uh, are, are backing uh, the resistance to, to Israel, uh, and um, but not the PLO. The PLO and Iran don't get along. Uh, one is secular, one is religious, and uh, uh, the, the Saudis are, uh, ironically enough, are more likely to, to back the PLO. So Hamas has those tunnels, and uh, it obviously was able to import somehow uh, some uh, high-powered uh, rockets. It uh, has a lot of little kind of homemade rockets, which you hear, you know, they, they fired 5,000 rockets. But most of them are eighth-grade high school experiments. But, but in this October 7th attack, they had some precision munitions uh, and it's not clear how, how this gets into Gaza, maybe through the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, but probably uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps is, is slipping these munitions to, to, uh, to Hamas somehow. Uh, and um, uh, otherwise it's hard to see. And, and then where did they get the training? Because, you know, this October 7th uh, attack, which, uh, you know, you have to keep repeating, it was inhumane and atrocious and horrific and uh, uh, horrible. Uh, it killed 1,400 people, uh, 1,200 of them, men, women, children, grandmothers, babies, etc. It was a horrible thing. Uh, but if you just looked, stood back and looked at it as a military operation, they did kill 200 Israeli soldiers. It took an Israeli base. Uh, and they were able to uh, use some precision uh, munitions to target is Israeli military targets. Um, so this was a pretty sophisticated operation, as horrible as it was. Where did they get the training uh, to, to carry this kind of thing off? And so, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the answer lay with, with Iran. But I don't think that the Iranians ordered them to do quite what they did. So finally, though, has, has there been a shifting of the plates? Are we in a new, you know, inter international Cold War? Uh, uh, what is going on and where does Saudi Arabia come in? Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned make a very interesting point uh, uh, about the Sunni Shiite dispute, which has been a bit forgotten in most uh, journal journalistic accounts. And uh, what, what, which, after all, the Iraq War had something to do with, and their, Iran's influence was extended to Iraq thanks to American policy. But I want to ask, finally, maybe as a way of sort of looking at the whole package, when I was in uh, Egypt and then went to Gaza and then went to West Bank and Israel and so forth, the big issue in in the U.S. was, and fi following the example of France. And, and England, mostly England, uh, was very uh, much opposed to Arab, pan-Arab nationalism. And you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and this was not a movement that was primarily concerned about the fate of the Palestinians or indeed, really, Israel. It was a notion of how do you advance a common Arab perspective and modernization and everything else. And uh, Nasser was this leader who was sort of a part of a non-alignment movement. And Israel got drawn into that, right? And when I was there at that time, I thought, wait a minute, how did this happen? I thought the big issue was the Suez Canal, you know, and, and who would control trade and pan-Arab uh, vision. And, and somehow, uh, the, the Six-Day War, and you, you know the literature better than anyone, was that a, something that they got lured into? Was was Israel attacked? That's, after all, the moral justification for their having these lands, right, of the West Bank and Gaza, is that they were attacked and they defeated. Everybody thinks they defeated the Palestinians. They defeated Egypt and Syria. So, so how was your reassessment of that history? Well, the... the Historical evidence is that Abdel Nasser in Egypt uh, had sent his crack troops, some hundred thousand of them, to, to intervene in the Yemen civil war. Uh, he was in no way prepared for a war with Israel uh, and uh, didn't fire the first shot. In fact, the Russians, who were Egypt's patron, 
told the Egyptians that if they fired the first shot, that the Russians would abandon them. They'd be on their own. Uh, so the Israelis fired the first shot. This is the old Soviet Union. Yeah, the old which, Soviet. by the way, along with the United States, were the first two nations to recognize Israel, right? Sure. Well, the, the, the Soviets had uh, correct relations with Israel, but in this era of the late 60s, they were siding very strongly with Syria and Egypt. But they didn't want trouble, and and uh, unless it you know was inevitable, if the Israelis attacked, then it would be inevitable. So the the Soviets told the Egyptians they may not start a war, and so in 1967 it was the Israelis who who, who attacked, uh, and uh, they did so because they were afraid uh, of the rhetoric coming out of Cairo and Damascus. But it was, if you if you know the situation on the ground, it, it was mainly rhetoric. Uh, and um, the Israelis defeated the Egyptians uh, by bombing their uh, planes on the ground. They did to the Egyptians what the Japanese did to the United States in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, uh, and then the Egyptian tanks had no air cover, whereas the Israeli tanks did have air cover. And so planes plus tanks beat, beat tanks. Uh, they, 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 they defeated the Egyptians rather handily and took the Sinai uh, right up to the Suez Canal. And uh, they also uh, took advantage of their defeat of Egypt and of Syria uh, to seize uh, the Palestinian territories, which, as you say, were not uh, part of the war. They were just civilians, they were farmers mostly, uh, but the Israelis seized those territories. And then they began colonizing them uh, and incorporating them into their power sphere uh, to the point now where they're inextricable. Uh, I don't believe that the Saudis uh, will be put off from recognizing Israel and having economic relations with it for very long. Uh, you know, eventually this problem with uh, Gaza will be resolved in one way or another. We've seen now many such conflicts with Gaza and, and, and the Israelis, and uh, uh, they, they, they come to a desultory end at some point. Uh, I think the Saudis have to be careful of, even though they're an absolute monarchy, of public opinion and the, the public in Saudi Arabia is very unhappy uh, with uh, what's being done to, to the Palestinians of Gaza by the Israelis. Uh, and so it's it's not an opportune moment to go forward at the mo at, 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 right at this instant. But in the long term, uh, it seems clear that uh, the power behind the throne, the, the crown prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, um, isn't an Arab nationalist. And he met with the Jewish community in New York and told them that the Palestinians were not high on his list of priorities. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think the, the money to be made, the technological transfers that are possible, the uh, investment possibilities, the startups, which we, we've seen happen between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, uh, are very attractive to the Saudi elite. Uh, and so, uh, that that process may well continue. Uh, the Palestinians offer nothing. Uh, they uh, uh, they have been turned into refugees and uh, powerless people, stateless people without uh, citizenship in a state or rights. Uh, they don't count, and and nobody's going to go to bat for them in a big way. Uh, and you know it's ironic because when the Nazis uh, took citizenship away from the German Jews. Uh, they said that everybody's is criticizing us for how we treat our, our Jews. But now that they're stateless, that they're flotsam, let's see who will take them, who wants them. And of course, the United States wouldn't let them in, and not very many were let into Britain, and Brazil wouldn't let them in, and so on and so forth. The Nazis were right. Once you make people stateless and you deprive them of that position of having citizenship and passports and recognition, then you become gypsies, you become uh, uh, flotsam, and nobody, everybody is afraid of you. I mean, I, I interviewed Palestinians in Lebanon who said that, you know, they have no, no passports, they're stateless. They have what's called a laissez-passe, uh, something that lets them go across borders from the UN, but uh, nobody accepts it. They said they're, they're, the other countries are afraid that if they let them in, they'll, they'll just overstay their visa and, and, and remain. Uh, and so they're trapped. They said, we, we've been in prison here in Lebanon. They're not allowed to own property in Lebanon or to work in most professions. 
uh, they're they're stateless. There's hundreds of thousands of them like that. They were expelled by the Israelis in 1948, and they're still in that condition. Uh, so they just don't count. And uh, the the sad tragedy of it is that uh, we can, I think, humanitarians and people who care about uh, a, a normative international order, which was the mantra that the Biden administration kept deploying against Russia and Ukraine. Uh, those of us who care about that uh, have to stand up for Palestinian rights, uh, but we are voices in the wilderness, and the people who have their hands on the levers of power are, are uh, fully with uh, allowing the Israelis to get away literally with murder, and I don't anticipate uh, that that will change. You know, you present all this with a kind of weary wisdom but in your article, there was a strong emotional content. And what I took away from it, uh, and something I have felt for the longest time ever since I visited the region, uh, and, you know, ironically, back then, at least some prominent Israelis said they agreed with me. <laughs> maybe they were lying, maybe they were deceiving themselves that the Palestinians have been put in the historic role of the Jews. That they, uh, yes, because they're stateless, they can be exploited in, in Jordan, they can be exploited in uh, Lebanon, everywhere. And, uh, and yet they have an identity, they have a history, they have a sense of self. They don't want to abandon it. Other nations don't make it easy for them to come in because I guess they're to resistance. Sometimes the same arguments are used against them that were used against the Jews, that they're maybe overeducated or maybe you know, too good at some activities. They're used as advisors, financial people, and so forth. Throughout the Arab world, they fit in uh, and so forth. And what I want to get at finally, you've been very patient with your time, but you, you, know, you have such a great uh, I think, reputation as a historian of this stuff. And we hear a lot about fake news, fake history. Uh, I can't think of any subject that has been so distorted in, in this depiction uh, as this one. Uh, and, and it's biblical in its distortion. And taking this biblical image, this Israel has, throughout its existence, relied on the view before Israel where Jews were persecuted at will and certainly in Europe and and uh, the David and Goliath image and and right now Israel still acts as if it's David I mean claims to be has this hugely powerful army can imprison millions of people and the world celebrates it at least part of the world we have here in the United States and in the academic community, uh, you are much more likely to lose your job uh, or your next job if you uh, think something similar happened to you, if you dare suggest such a thing. It's heresy. But the fact is, you know, the Palestinians are in the traditional position that the Jews were in wandering. Uh, and and uh, why? how can people avoid that? I mean, your colleagues or I, I just don't get it, you know, uh, and, and you, there, I happen, just one little footnote. You mentioned, I mean, just the thing you said, the Six Day War is supposed to be this great thing that Israel did reluctantly because it wouldn't be accepted by these people and by these people includes the Palestinians. And I landed at that airport in Egypt. That's how I got there at the tail end of the war. And you could see that the dummy planes were not hit. The actual planes were hit because Israeli intelligence supplied by the United States was such a high level. They knew exactly that that this was not Goliath uh, and that they, uh, you know, combined. We, we were presented with this image of hundreds of millions of Arabs threatening plucky little Israel it was quite the opposite. Israel was backed by the most powerful nation in the world and an incredible military machine already in place. Uh, and so it's fake history. It's actually fake history being visited. And now everybody's talking as if this Hamas attack came out of nowhere. Right? It was a prison break. I mean, I, I, I don't know. How do we think about truth and history and yeah. everything? And if you dare, actually, what I just said 
you know, you will be condemned. I mean, you will be manufacturing a bad history. You will be anti-Semitic. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think we've ever lived in a time quite like this. I mean, at least under McCarthyism, there was a, a sort of liberal backlash. You know, uh, now there isn't. Well, let's face it, it took a while for the liberal backlash to amount to anything. Uh, pe- people were arrested and put in jail for wrong thoughts in the late 40s and 50s until the Supreme Court finally weighed in in 1957 and said, no, you can't jail people for, for thoughts. Uh, but uh, that was 10 years. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a difference between how I view what's happening because I'm outraged and then broken up inside and people that I know on both sides uh, have been harmed uh, uh, by, by what has happened. Uh, and so I can write passionately about it. But if you ask me what I th- if I think that this is a turning point or that some new historical formation is going to come out of it, I'm very pessimistic about that. Uh, I, I, I think there's, there's a, a set of structural problems here uh, that, uh, that, that interfere with, with uh, this issue getting settled. Uh, and so if I have to step back and put on my analysis hat, uh, I, I actually have to say something pretty pessimistic. In my view, the, the whole problem is, is the fault of the Washington elite. Uh, the United States could have intervened to solve this at any point along the way, and they haven't. I think it's partly because they're cowardly. Maybe they lack vision. I give props to Clinton. That was an interesting approach in the Oslo Accords uh, in, in, in 1993, which perhaps had some uh, potential of resolving uh, the issue. I don't think we'd be seeing this attack by Hamas if if the Oslo Accords had been implemented. Uh, but they mandated that Israel relinquish uh, the Palestinian West Bank and Gaza by 1997. And in the 10 years after those accords were signed, the Israelis doubled the number of uh, settlers that they sent in uh, to, to live on Palestinian land that they usurped, uh, and so they they derailed uh, the the, the, uh, the accords, uh, and um, and the United States let them do it. Uh, and and since then, since the late 1990s, the United States has done nothing uh, of any significance uh, to resolve this situation. Uh, you know, if it just wouldn't veto uh, the United Nations Security Council condemnations of Israel and allow UNSC sanctions to be imposed for the things Israel is doing, the Israelis would back off. Uh, But the U.S. runs interference for them and lets them get away with murder. Look, let's end this, but I can't, you know, it's not our job on, on a show like this to come up with a rosy ending. But there's something really big at stake here. On the campuses right now, our country, being uh, apologetic for Israel is actually put as your moral duty. Uh, And uh, somehow this attack wipes out any oppression, any occupation. I mean, this occupation of a whole nother people has been going on for more than half a century. Uh, And, uh, you know, now they can be killed in much larger numbers because somehow their lives are less worth. They're held responsible for everything their government does. Americans are not held responsible for everything our government, at least we don't. Some of us are in opposition, but they're, every Palestinian anywhere in the world is now responsible for this attack by Hamas. Uh, certainly not every Jewish person feels responsible for everything the Israeli government is doing now in blasting Gaza apart. And I just wonder you know, in biblical terms, uh, whether in fact this is not another affirmation of Goliath's winning. Uh, that, uh, you know, and, and what is odd about it, there's no soul searching about it. Uh, because the fact is, you know, and it's not the example of Islamophobia, because as you point out, the PLO is hardly a religious organization. Hamas obviously is, but no more so than many others, 
And we have no trouble at all really getting along, say, with the center of a certain notion of a, 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 a totalitarian Islam in Saudi Arabia that actually, uh, you know, killed a, a, a Saudi person working as, uh, in the Washington Post and so forth. The president goes over and fist bumps. Uh, you know, if Israel has been threatened by any Islamic country, it, it was these countries that they're now getting along with quite well and uh, recognize. And so they're actually, the wandering Jew is now a Palestinian. And and uh, and it doesn't concern anybody. I mean, concerns a small, relatively small group of people. But really, it's it's all great power politics. What will they accommodate and so forth? And so, I don't know, I'm going to give you the last word since you actually wrote this important book about the Prophet Muhammad. You've covered this region so extensively. And how does it all end? It ends with what? Power rules and, and nothing else matters, right? Well, it depends on the time scale that we're, we're thinking about. Uh, in the short to medium term, I, I'm afraid that's right, that the power will rule uh, and the, uh, the poor Palestinians are likely to get the, the wrong end of the stick. Uh, I think, it, as you say, uh, there, it is horrible to see uh, the stereotyping and the uh, demeaning of Arabs and Muslims, uh, which are not exactly the same thing. Uh, throughout uh, Europe and the United States, and we see it uh, on uh, college campuses and my own campus, uh, and uh, kind of uh, tarring all Arabs or Muslims with the Hamas brush, uh, which couldn't be more unfair uh, because Hamas is a, a tiny movement in a, a very small corner of, uh, of the Muslim world. And even opinion polling showed that it wasn't popular uh, among people in Gaza uh, last year, uh, so uh, much less in the rest of the world. And um, But this is typical of war propaganda, because one of the things that is necessary for uh, the right-wing Israelis to do what they want to do is to dehumanize the Palestinians. Uh, so they're calling them human animals. Uh, they're, uh, they're saying things like that, that all civilians in in Gaza are Hamas, and therefore there are no civilians, and all the lives are fair game. Uh, and then anyone who objects to this uh, uh, really genocidal way of speaking uh, is then tarred as, as a uh, supporter of Hamas. But we should be able, in a democracy, uh, to, uh, to walk and chew gum at the same time Nobody put a gun to the leaders of Hamas's head and said, you have to shoot up a music festival and, and shoot down, you know, innocent people who were enjoying some music, most of whom were peaceniks, uh, and, and kill 260 of them with machine gun fire. Nobody made them do that. That was a choice on their part. And it, it, it is true that Gaza is occupied and they're in a horrible situation and you could expect an explosion because of that, but you couldn't necessarily expect that explosion. I mean, this what, what Hamas did was, was not even in character for the, the historic action of, of the group. They've, they've committed terrorism in the past, but not on this scale or in quite this way. Uh, so th they made a choice and we have to condemn that choice, that, that choice harmed large numbers of, of innocent people and uh, some of whom some of us knew. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, as I said, it was clearly the action of a small group, uh, which did not consult with its constituency or with anybody else uh, for matters of secrecy. And to, to have the Israelis bomb a refugee camp, and they are refugees because in 1948, they were ethnically cleansed from Southern Israel uh, to bomb a refugee camp because they said one or a handful of Hamas commanders were known to be in that camp uh, and to kill dozens of people, wound uh, hundreds uh, with a uh, uh, an enormous bomb that leaves a crater 
and knocks out an entire apartment block uh, full of women and children, uh, for, for the Israelis to behave in this way uh, is no different from the people who committed atrocities uh, in World War II and, and some of whom were, were tried for war crimes. Uh, this re resembles what the, uh, what the Japanese did in the Philippines or the, the uh, Luftwaffe, the, the German uh, um, Air Force's uh, reduction of, of Warsaw in Poland to, to rubble. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it seems clear to me that it is a war crime and it, it fits the international definition of, of, of genocide. So both of these things can be true, uh, that, that Hamas is a terrorist organization now, which has committed unspeakable atrocities. And the Israelis in, under international law have a right to go after Hamas and attempt to destroy that organization. But they don't have a right recklessly to endanger millions of uh, ordinary Palestinian noncombatants. And, and reg regardless of what the Israeli right thinks, they are women, children, pregnant women, uh, toddlers, and, uh, they, and, and they didn't never voted for Hamas. So finally, I go return to the way I opened this. You said uh, you can consider Netanyahu a fascist. Will Israel continue to support this kind of stance? Will it have new currency? Uh, and will it remain attractive? Uh, because after all, to hold uh, these people, uh, you know, assuming they will obviously have control militarily over uh, both, uh, you know, Gaza and the West Bank, uh, will the Israeli public, they seem to be, have changed or shifted on that? You know, what, what do you predict? And isn't there a breaking point you know, in, in terms of people in the United States or whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, uh, I mean, is it, will it always be a blank check? Or it's not a blank check. It's a, a right. It's a very large, what, sixteen billion dollar check that they're just giving now to a country clearly doesn't need much more in the way of military support. What what is your expectation? Well, I, I agree that uh, the there's likely to be changes in the next election in Israel. But I fear that they have nothing to do with the Palestinian issue. They, uh, the many middle class uh, Israelis are afraid of the extremists that Netanyahu brought into government. They're afraid that those people will take away women's rights. They'll take away uh, gay rights, that they'll uh, re reduce the currency of the rule of law in Israeli society. Uh, they will uh, take away what, what rights the, the uh, Israelis of Palestinian heritage have, which are 20% of the population. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that, uh, that Netanyahu and his, uh, his extremist allies uh, are likely to uh, be punished at the polls. Uh, but were uh, the, some of the wilder Israeli schemes of uh, um, pushing all of the 2.2 million people in Gaza into half the territory in the south and setting up the north as a demilitarized zone of sorts. Uh, uh, were those kinds of uh, plans to be implemented? I don't think they'll have anything at all to do with the next Israeli election. That That's not what people are consumed about when they go to the polls in Israel. So is it, okay, the end of time, so it's the end of uh, any expectation uh, for the Palestinians? Is it over? Well, it's very dark. I might it, let me put one provocative idea, and not to encourage conspiracy thinking, uh, but this is kind of a gift. Gr br grotesque as it is, brutal as it is, to the right wing in Israel. This is an affirmation of their worst warnings. This is uh, m maybe it will save Netanyahu's career. We don't know. Uh, and uh, maybe not because he seems to bear some responsibility for a lack of preparedness. But nonetheless, um, you know, uh, finally, I mean, I, I, that's a no, I would be unhappy if I ended this without asking this question. This Hamas, this small group, might they spin some kind of uh, 
Why did this happen? These people were perfectly capable of negotiating their terms, of surviving, of extending their power. Uh, they were gaining influence. They seemed to be able to work out accommodations with Israel. And suddenly, bam, this happens. It's a speculative uh, matter, but uh, question, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I think that both regional geopolitics and Israeli policy was uh, threatening to pull the rug out from under the Palestinians. They became desperate. Uh, at home in Israel, uh, the, uh, the, the, the re religious Zionists and the um, uh, Jewish power uh, figures in the Netanyahu government were conducting ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the West Bank. They were moving them out of villages. The, uh, the settler population of Israelis on Palestinian land are armed and they were going in wilding and attacking Palestinian villages, uh, shooting them up. Uh, and they have continued to do this under the cover of the current conflict uh, at a large scale. Uh, the Israeli army attacked congregants at the Aqsa Mosque uh, on many occasions and brutalized them. And uh, there's a, a move among the Jewish power uh, faction to usurp uh, at least some of the uh, of the Al Aqsa Mosque uh, complex uh, for Jewish purposes, uh, reduce Muslim prerogatives there. Uh, which is a non-starter for, uh, for those devoted to the Muslim cause. And then regionally, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Sudan, Morocco, and now possibly Saudi Arabia were, were making separate peace with Israel and throwing the Palestinians under the bus. And every time someone did that, as with the United Arab Emirates, the Israelis got access to tremendous piles of capital and investment in startups and uh, opportunities for technology exchange, uh, which made the Israelis even more powerful against the increasingly destitute Palestinians. So between the uh, ethnic cleansing campaign of, of the religious nationalists on the West Bank, the attacks on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and this threat that uh, the Israelis could just sidestep the Palestinian issue and get very rich dealing with the uh, with the Gulf monarchies, uh, I think inspired a desperation uh, in the leadership of Hamas that that they could well just be bypassed by by history. And um, I think these apocalyptic groups get in their minds that some dramatic action could reverse the course of of human history. And you know we saw this with uh, Al Qaeda and the attacks of nine eleven. Why did why did they think they could change history by attacking the United States. Well, they thought they maybe they could push the United States out of the Middle East or, or if, if the U.S. came in, they thought they could do to them what they had done to the uh, Soviet army in Afghanistan. Uh, so th this was uh, almost Hegelian, you know, that they, they thought that they can reformulate the trajectory of future history with, with this uh, uh, horrific and dramatic action. And, uh, uh, I think it's it's a stupid theory of history, and uh, wherever it's been tried, it it, it has uh, uh, failed and crashed and burned, and it will for Hamas uh, here as well. But I, I don't. I, I think that the the desperation uh, that the Palestinians were feeling was was real. And once again, the Arab governments that claim to speak in their interest and be concerned are going to make out like bandits. They're going to have new agreements and new treaties. They're the ones who caused uh, or at least legitimatized the Six-Day War. Uh, I would have to remind people in closing this that it was not the Palestinians who attacked Israel, but rather uh, the governments that Israel seems to get along with quite well. And in fact, we may have a repeat of what Roosevelt did in turning away the refugees with the Egyptian government. Uh, not uh, not only, but maybe they'll be shooting Palestinian refugees. And after all, Jordan has not always been kind to its very substantial Palestinian population. So again, I just want to throw that note in that the Palestinians are 
actually much more akin in their experience historically to the Jews uh, than the mass media in this country wants to acknowledge. I want to thank you, Juan Cole. As far as, as I began, I think you are our leading expert in this country on these issues. And I want to thank you for taking this time. I want to thank Laura Kandarajian and Christopher Ho at KCRW, the uh, NPR station in Santa Monica for hosting uh, these shows. I want to thank Joshua Shear, our uh, executive producer, uh, Diego Ramos, who writes the introduction, Max Jones, who puts the video together. And I want to particularly thank the JKW uh, Foundation in the memory of Gene Stein, uh, uh, one of the uh, Jewish public figures uh, uh, who actually st stood up for the Palestinians as human beings and uh, was a close ally of Edward Said, who was a great Palestinian intellectual. So on that note, let's end this edition of Sheer Intelligence. See you next week. <laughs>